Hello, welcome back to uh, my Deutsche Vlog, uh, a series of um, conversations I have with media scholars from around the world that I'm a huge fan of. Um, you can watch these interviews on YouTube um, or listen to them um, as a podcast available on all major podcast platforms. I hope you like, subscribe to these interviews, uh, perhaps use them in your teaching or in your studies. Um, the, the idea here is to just to get to know the people who are responsible for so many amazing insights into the role media play in society and life just a little bit better. And today we're in for a treat. Um, um, I sat down with uh, Professor Sonia Livingston of the London School of Economics. And uh, Sonia is an amazing scholar uh, who for many decades has um, uh, produced work, engaged in policy debates and, and, and truly made a difference in the way we look at media and, and audiences. Audiences, whether these are families, or kids at school, or children all over the world trying to navigate our digital by default existence. Sonia uh, is professor of social psychology and former head uh, and co-founder of the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has published 20 books on media audiences, particularly children and young people's risks and opportunities in the media, media literacy, and human rights in a digital environment. Um, some of her recent books include The Class, uh, Living and Learning in a Digital Age, published by New York University Press, um, uh, co-authored with Julian Sefton Green. And another book we'll be talking about today is Parenting for a Digital Future, How Hopes and Fears About Technology Shape Children's Lives, published uh, by Oxford University Press and uh, written with uh, Alicia Bloom-Ross. Sonia currently directs the Digital Futures Commission uh, with the Five Rights Foundation and the long-running Global Kids Online project with uh, UNICEF. Um, she's the deputy director of the Nurture Network, founder of the European Commission-funded 33-country EU Kids Online Research Network, and she's a hashtag Safer Internet for EU ambassador for the European Commission. She has been a visiting professor at universities all over the world. She's on the editorial board of numerous leading journals. She served uh, as the president of the International Communication Association in 2007 and 2008. Her presidential address of that, that year is one of the and one of her most cited articles in the field of media and communication, titled On the Mediation of Everything. She uh, was awarded the title of Officer in the Order of the British Empire in 2014 for services to children and child internet safety, and in 2019 received the Erasmus Medal of the Academia Europea, uh, awarded to a scholar who has maintained over a sustained period the highest level of international scholarship and recognition by their peers. Sonia is a star. Um, a, a, an example for, for, for a lot of us and uh, it's been a true privilege for me to get to know her over the years and, and to be able to sit down with her uh, for this interview where we'll be talking of course about her recent books about um, the adoption of general comment number 25 by the United Nations uh, uh, just recently uh, securing um, the rights of children in a digital environment but we're also going to go back to her earliest work um, as a PhD student at the University of Oxford in the mid and late 1980s, um, trying to sort of unravel the threads that connect her, her different projects and books and publications and how she solves the problem, if it is a problem, um, of, on the one hand, 
wanting to do justice to the unique experiences and stories and voices of the people we study, and the other hand, of making a difference and having an impact in the world, not just in the so-called ivory tower of academia, but in the so-called real world of policy, society, and people's everyday lives. Um, I hope you have a chance to sit back and enjoy, and, uh, and, and please leave a comment and engage in a conversation, because I know that's what Sonia would want. I wanted to start with uh, asking you whether you're still cycling under your desk. <laughs> I love that idea of you <laughs> cycling. You know, we, we have to find ways to survive Zoom. So I have the the, the cycle under my desk. Right. I um, uh, So I shouldn't really tell my colleagues which meetings I cycle during, but uh -huh. I do cycle during. If I'm not required to write, but if I have to write or then I can't, so. Right, yeah, 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 because you are moving, right? Yeah. Well, the yeah. moving, people don't mind that. They think it's healthy. Yeah, no, no, but but like cycling and writing, I mean, that seems- That's hard, that's too hard, yeah. Yeah, 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 no, I, I mean, I, I don't cycle under the desk, but I've become like a cycling nutcase uh, during this whole COVID thing. I like all of a sudden, I'm now walking around in Lycra as if it's completely normal. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are in their pajamas, but um, lycra, okay. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. tight and just rocking, going outside, you know, in full view. It seems, yeah, I'm, that that's my 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 pandemic. Yeah, I am. Therapy. I'm in jeans and muddy boots, and I'm just looking all the time for some green and for some uh, big skies and for some, uh, yeah, escape from the uh, the glorious Zoom. Yes, the the, the screen. Which the sc we have now. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah, but but yeah. So thanks for 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 spending some time inside and 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 with this conversation. Really really appreciate it, Sonia. That's that's really great. And and I want to start um, ask you some questions about. Um, I, I guess we could say this like you know the the incredible impact of your work and most recently the adoption of General Comment uh, Twenty Five by the United Nations, which sets out. Um, the how the con, United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child also applies in a digital environment. Now, this is the culmination, and it's not the end, but it's the culmination of a lot of years of hard work, of lobbying, of advocacy on your part and part, of course, of many colleagues, uh, for example, through the many country EU Kids Online Network that you founded. Um, and, and, and of course, I, I would love to hear a little bit more of, of, of how you got here uh, uh, with this project. Um, and specifically, I'm, I'm, I, I would really want to know um, how, on the one hand, especially during the whole Corona context, I mean, we're all pretty much aware of the fact that it's policymakers or pundits or journalists or academics, of course, of sort of the incredible interdependence between us and our digital environment. Eh? That, 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 I mean, that's pretty clear. I, I mean, among us as media scholars, we've been saying this for quite some time now, but everybody kind of feels it, sees it, is aware of it. On the other hand, as you note in, in, in your work, there's been this incredible reluctance on the part of policymakers to translate that into rights-based policies, uh, whether it's human rights or in this case, children's rights. So what have you learned about that that might explain this reluctance, especially to see media as more than just vehicles for business or you know, state governance? Um, and instead seeing them for the platforms for, you know, life that they are for us. Yeah, lots of questions there, Mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering where to, where to start. Um, okay, I'll start maybe with the idea of impact. Um, mm. So I would say in my career, I have begun thinking about uh, the impact of my work since long before we ever had any obligation to do it from, you know, from the way our research is evaluated by the government. Um, right. But somewhere early on, those accusations about living in an ivory tower and ideas for ideas sake um, uh, started to get to me. Um, and the sense of academics having this kind of rarefied privileged existence that never benefited others really did begin to kind of um, 
you know, of course I believe in ideas for ideas sake, and I believe that um, uh, universities should be stacked full of people who are just thinking and libraries should be full of knowledge that uh, is uh, often esoteric and um, expert. But I also found that I wanted to kind of get out and do more kind of bridge building and more explaining and um, increasingly, you know, my, my, my career has been through the, uh, I think of it as through the, the, the decades in which um, media have moved, as you say, from being something that seemed like a luxury, a leisure thing, a kind of an add on to life to becoming the infrastructure for our lives. And that means that so many of the things we debate in the academy are just so vital um, much more broadly, and I wanted to kind of get out and start making those arguments. Probably, um, you know, beginning uh, maybe with the work I, I did with um, Peter Lunt on talk on television, and that was kind of became an argument about public service and what the role of public service broadcasting then was. Um, and uh, it's gone through kind of many, many layers, but I'll tell you the big, the big surprise I found because academics mm. are always telling me, uh, oh, it's such an extra, it's such an effort to kind of do your work. And then you've also got to do that kind of stuff, that outreach stuff, that impact stuff. And I cannot express how much I have learned intellectually through that process of engagement, mm. of kind of um, honing arguments, of learning from, practice and uh, everyday activities and policy making where arguments stand up where distinctions hold water where evidence is needed um, and where um, what the rebuttals might be um, so I see it as a very robust intellectual exchange to kind of get the ideas out there and so it's always a learning process and more recently in relation to thinking about children's rights in a digital age it's a very, for me, it's a very um, two way process of kind of seeing what does the academy have to offer? What have we learned through our research and knowledge? Take it out. Does it does it hold up? Does it, mm -hmm. you know, can I um, when the lawyers look at it, do they find it convincing when the teachers in classrooms look at um, what we have to say about online learning? Do they find it helpful? And so often the engagement process sends me back to the drawing board and I'm kind of always now hunting uh, for more and better academic work that can um, be practical and useful and robust so um, so I think in terms of that process of engagement for me it's been um, quite eye-opening to see how much um, intellectual development comes from uh, wider engagement mm. and I think academics just don't always get that point right but, it, it, yeah no 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 but but that, that that's I mean uh, it, it's interesting that in your in, in your answer it, you you gravitate towards this notion of, of of two things that that for me keep coming back throughout your work on the, on, on the one end this immediate reference to yeah but what do in, in, in academic terms, are the participants in our work have to say, right? I mean, what's the perspective of the child with his or her mobile phone? Or what is what does this particular family do with media? And we can say all kinds of things about, as the title of your latest book, Parenting in a Digital Age, but what about this particular family or that particular uh, um, um, uh, social environment? How, how do they solve everyday issues with, with media? So very much that sort of grounded perspective and, and, and advocating for the voice of, uh, uh, of, of just regular people trying to make it work in media. While on the other hand, as, as, as you say, uh, also thinking in terms of, of impact. Uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so, so it's, it's, it's it, I mean, how do you find a balance between on the one hand, staying away from immediately talking about big social transformations that a lot of us are doing in, in, in our field, sort of yeah, they, we, we throw around big concepts and, you know, the media is changing everything. Uh, mm. And you, 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 you tend to stay away from that. On the other hand, you, you are, and, and I mean this in the most complimentary way, quite ambitious, right? Yeah. right, right in, 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 in not just advocating for the people you do research on or with, but also for the voice of media scholarship in public debates. Uh -huh. So, so, so how, how do you how do you um, 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 uh, strike a balance uh, between those sort of um, uh, claims or demands on our work? 
One thing I'm always saying to my students is um, the question is not how does all of that work out there um, contribute to what you're trying to do, but how does what you're trying to do contribute to that body of work out there? Mm -hmm. So I think in a world, um, and I mean this nicely, in which there are many scholars ready to paint the big picture and talk about the macro, political and economic processes, what's missing over and again, in, in my view, is the way in which that matters because it impacts on an, the experience of people in their ordinary lives. Or maybe, um, so partly it's missing and partly I feel that's the, that's the part that I can provide. Um, and mm. I can provide it partly because I'm trained as a social psychologist, um, partly because I just, um, um, my work is kind of uh, re-energized and um, re, uh, I kind of recommit to my research when I go out and I start talking to people a bit more than when I start um, reading big ideas in, in, in um, books in the library. So there's something for me that's very creative about listening to people's experience. Um, mm. I love the way it's uh, kind of... Um, only in some ways partially articulated, in other ways uh, brilliantly synthetically articulated, um, but always kind of lived. And so I, I it, it, it sort of, um, it, it compels me to find the framing. I mean, I would say in, in Parenting for Digital Future um, and in my other books, you know, I, I always try to situate the experience of people within that frame. So, um, certain big theories. So uh, you'll probably know I've worked with the um, ideas of Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck in kind of framing a theory of late modernity within which technology plays a particular role in contributing to risk and adding to uncertainty and kind of um, uh, creating connections that unsettle tradition. Uh, so I'm very kind of keen to put people's everyday experience in conjunction with that and see what, what results. Um, but I increasingly guess I do also want the work to, I want it to speak in both directions. Right. Uh, so when I read the, the, the grand theories that don't, that leave out people's experience, it's true, I'm incensed, I want to kind of put it in, that's what my contribution is. Um, but when I see people struggling with technology and every, every you know, my, my, my last book on parenting every parent is desperate to tell me how they struggle with technologies um, and then as you say I really want to find something within the academy that is going to be constructive right. uh, and it's very difficult to just say to them oh yeah you're right we're, we're we are all despairing too we think that technology's taken over and we're all believing in this kind of dystopian future in which um uh, the platforms have um uh, co-opted and corrupted us and there's no hope i mean you just can't say that to people see <laughs> so so there's something about working with ordinary people in their experience that makes it imperative to find some openings, some possibilities for action or resistance or alternative vision. Um, otherwise, uh, it's not a plausible conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's um, I, I mean, this, this, this sort of balance really comes out beautifully, I mean, in, in, in all of your work, but, but specifically in the previous book that you did on the class uh, with uh, Julian Sefton Green and, and where, where you follow uh, a, a group of, of, of kids, 13, 14 year olds in a school in London for over a year. And, and, and um, I mean, it's incredibly rich, detailed, uh, uh, sort of an appreciation of, of the role that media plays. And, and it's interesting that you link that study to a premise from colleagues in the educational uh, community. Uh, and, and you say that, you know, to challenge the equation of innocence and ignorance in childhood, uh, instead, insisting that children are learning all the time uh, outside of school as well as within it, and 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 what they know should be recognized and valued, which is again sort of an appreciation of 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 the the, the value of the perspective of somebody who actually goes through this phenomenon that we're studying. Um, and and but the, interestingly, that your conclusion in that book, at least one of them, isn't so much that you know digital media in the classroom sort of break down all the walls. Or the exact uh, opposite that they sort of um, that that we should erect new wall, walls to 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 protect that environment, but but it seems to me that one of the main points in your book and that follows on what you said earlier, 
is about to get everybody who participates in learning, which includes the children, but also their parents and the schools and policymakers and the sort of the whole environment of stakeholders, if you will, to get them to communicate just a bit better with each other and, and to listen to each other and to recognize what's going on. And it's a non, not a one size fits all kind of kind of deal. Now, and, and, and if that assessment is true, then, then I find this is incredibly inspiring because it's sort of hopeful it's optimistic it's that not it's not saying well digital media kind of destroy the classroom or like in journalism studies blow up the newsroom and it's also not the other way around that it's just bliss when kids can go on wikipedia as much as listening to a teacher uh -huh. um so, so how do you i guess what i would say how do you keep i'm not sure if you would label yourself optimistic but 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 at the very least, very positively inclined towards the possibility of communication. Um, um, how, how do you how do you I stick think to I'm that? I'm very determined to um, find where the possibilities uh, and kind of promising pathways might lie. So mm. yes, I completely um, I, I I well communication. I cannot imagine humanity without communication. And um, I'll tell you one. Um, uh, uh, as you know, I, I worked with Roger Silverstone for uh, quite a long time, including in, in setting up our department. And one of his um, favorite sayings was, in the end, when thinking about the media, in the end, it's all about power. Mm -hmm. And um, in my mind, a voice counters, and I said it to him, and I've said it since, no, in the end, it's all about communication. Mm -hmm. Because without communication, we are not human, we are not social, we can't create our, our culture, our shared beliefs, our, we, we are... Um, we are, we are nothing. Um, of course, as soon as you have communication, as soon as you have more than one person, you also have power. And so I'm not saying power is, and, and power is always in my mind and the questions of inequalities, but at heart, um, I do think I'm, I'm always kind of looking out for where are the, um, what kinds of communication are generating our shared understanding and our um, uh, positively and negatively, um, you know, in the class, we, we had a lot about the kind of the normative imposition of certain kinds of messaging, certain kinds of cultures that um, that serve to reproduce social class inequality or that serve to uh, create misunderstandings between parents and teachers such that there wasn't a kind of positive uh, environment of, of, of communication around a, a child. Um, so there are lots of lots of ways in which communication is, is deeply problematic, mm. um, but it's tracing those uh, connections and disconnections, as, as we said in, in that book. Um, and the class was a brilliant opportunity to kind of get kind of up close and personal with, with a group of people. You know, very often in my career, I've, I've kind of come in, I do a, a focus group, it can feel quite intense, or an interview, it can feel quite intense. I spend an hour with somebody or two hours. Um, but in the class, we spent um, over a year with them. And right. that was a unique research experience for me, though, um, you know, for audience researchers, the, the increasing importance of, of ethnographic work and anthropological work means that we are increasingly kind of engaging with um, research that relies on that kind of embedded and extended uh, engagement with, 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 with um, people. But uh, for me, this was the first time I, I, I got to spend, really get to know people and really think about the, you know, it's when, I, when I want to promote people's voice or listen to what they say, I'm not naively over um, relying on that. So the yeah. other point about spending a year with people was that I could see what, understand what they had to say, observe them, you know, think about the contrast between what people say and how they act, think about how they change uh, their understandings or their behaviors over time. So a one shot account isn't the only thing that kind of summarizes that, that person's uh, experience. Um, and get that contrast. In the class, we tried always to see, okay, here's a child, we have their sense, what their parents say about them, what their friends say about them, what their teachers say about them, how we observe them, how things change month on month. You know, it gives a much, um, a much more kind of complex sense of where communication and where mediated communication uh, shapes and uh, um, uh, generates possibilities for them. Mm. Now, now that incredibly beautiful attention to detail right i mean and and that fine great notion of of doing this kind of work uh of of letting 
people really be, <laughs> not mm. just speak, but just be, uh, and, 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 and without immediately framing them within some kind of grand theory or, 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 or whatever, is, 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 is beautiful. I mean, it's also very much at work in, in, in your new book, uh, in Parenting for Digital Age, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just wondering how you, I, I mean, as you know, to give this a little bit of context, I mean, I've been working um, um, on, on um, the new edition of our friend Dennis McQuill's, the late Dennis McQuill's handbook of mass communication theory. And, and, and of course, one of Dennis's main ways of framing our fields was to, 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 to show how there's this sort of tug of war between media centric and society centric explanations for the communication phenomenon, right? That, that you know, to explain things more from a, well, that's because of certain media kind of uh, uh, explanations or to say, well, you know, media are part of, of broader social uh, issues and transformations. And, and so media are helpful to look at those, but we kind of have to look to the side of media to, to really get at that. And, and um, by focusing so much on the, the nitty gritty detail of people's everyday lives and encounters with media, we you come to the inevitable conclusion as you do as well in your work world and 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 you see this a lot now in in work that as you say adopts more ethnographic perspectives as well as you know surveys and those kind of things that well it's like almost everybody has a unique experience with media everybody has their own unique way of dealing with it sure there are some common threads but generally speaking if you compare two kids you get two different stories and they're both relevant and they're, they're all uh, important so how do you get from that level of detail to say anything uh, general about the role of media in society? I mean, I find that, I mean, that of course is the ultimate challenge of all sort of accounts of, of media, society and everyday life. But it seems to me to be getting harder because of the increasingly detailed work that we're doing. Uh, how, how do you, how I, do you solve well, I that? I, I disagree. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, please. Um, so I, um, uh, it, this, this might seem simplistic, but um, I do find it productive to kind of think in terms of oppositions and binaries, and I spend a lot of time oscillating. So uh, two problems, okay. Uh, I spend a year with one class of rather similar children and, um, you know, living in the same area and so forth. Uh, and the differences among them become fascinating. Mm. Okay, switch to the Global Kids Online project. Um, we survey 15,000 children on all continents in high, middle and low income countries, and we hear something incredibly similar from all of them. They want more access to the Internet. They want less uh, discrimination in their access to and experience of the Internet. They are struggling to gain the benefits and they are uh, suffering from the kind of toxicity, as they would put it, and all, all the all the risks. Um, and when I look at those, you know, that kind of data and I talk to colleagues who are working in very different parts of the world um, and the story is remarkably similar so mm. there are some uh, very kind of shared ways in which as, as we said earlier digital technologies are becoming the taken for granted infrastructure of our lives I can have a conversation about um, uh, with, with my colleague Amanda Third we, we were talking about how children understand um, the data exploit the exploitation of their personal data and children in Cambodia or in Chile or in London or in uh, Lagos you know will all kind of say something very similar mm. about understanding how they uh, feel trapped by the uh, you know the 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 um, horrific bind by which they can only gain access to resources that realize their rights by um, uh, sacrificing their data and their privacy. Um, so there's some incredible commonalities in people's um, uh, living in the, the kind of digital dilemmas of, 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 our, of our lives. But at the same time, I do think it is uh, crucial to recognize that two children sitting side by side in a class can be embedded in different kinds of um, communication or subcultural networks. Um, and they look the same, but one of them is part of a I don't know, a, 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 a particular uh, religious subculture within North London that um, means that uh, they also have another language group and they also have another uh, kind of music culture that they're part of and their family network spreads across a continent in a way that is completely different 
from, you know, maybe the kind of working class British child next to them who, um, who is kind of uh, struggling with social mobility from, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it, it, both of these things are true. Um, um, and that's, you know, the clue is in calling me a social psychologist. It is both the recognition of the psychological and the social and the tension between them. Um, one more thing uh, on, on, the, on the importance of media. So I think you will recognize, this is something I'm seeing with, with colleagues and students all the time. People say, I'm studying media and X, media and migration, media and poverty, media and inclusion, media and gender, whatever. And after a while, they get more and more drawn into the analysis of X, whatever it is. Right. And there's always a moment, where, there's often a moment when I say to a student, but now you're telling me about family life in China, or now you're telling me all about, um, you know, the, 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 the tensions of, of growing up as an adolescent in, in an unequal world. You've forgotten to tell me anything about the media. <laughs> and, um, and there's this kind of moment of head scratching because, you know, Dennis McQuayle is right. My, my um, colleague, uh, uh, Nick Caudry, also kind of writes about the myth that the media is always at the heart of our lives. And, Often it isn't, and the analysis takes us in other directions. But then, yeah, this is the 21st century. How do people know things? How do they connect? How do they engage? It is through digitally mediated technologies. And as we know, those are powerful, shaping, commercial, mm -hmm. insufficiently regulated, um, uh, in, in, intensely kind of complicatedly, subtly guiding us in particular directions in ways that people don't necessarily talk about. So that is our that is our struggle to recognize that what matters is often in other spaces than the media, but um, the media are provide are, are subtly shaping the access and the bar barriers and the possibilities. Yeah, I, I would almost imagine that it has become truly impossible to really still disentangle to talk, like you said, about media and Mm. Uh, b b b b I mean, like the, even the World Health Organization says, well, the infodemic is just as bad for us as the as the pandemic, right? These are not these these are inseparable processes that both have impacts on how we make sense of things and even whether we we're going to be surviving this mm -hmm. pandemic. So, so that 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 for me was like a real moment of, mm. oh boy, I mean, how <laughs> we're we're not going to tear these two things apart we have to constantly stay mindful of both uh and and in, I, I really appreciate in, in your in your in your answer just now you you reference to you know what we need to take it to into account if you look at things from a for example social psychological point of view or from a, a more cultural uh point of view and 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 I mean, I look back and found your 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 doctoral thesis uh, in, 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 at Oxford in 1987, like social knowledge and program structure and representations of television characters, and, and it was really fascinating that that comment is right there. In I mean, you, you may you say, well, well, theories social of social psychology and cognitive theories need to take and 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 you apply them to the study of television. Well, you need to take into account these kind of things. But from a cultural perspective, we have something to learn too, because, yeah, for example, we have to pay much more respect to the way viewers more or less autonomously make sense of their um, um, uh, of the reality that's presented to them in in, in television. So there's that that interdisciplinary uh, that that's traveling. Uh, different worlds, different perspectives that that is all, already uh, right there. I mean, where did did that come from, uh, Sonia? If I may ask, I mean, because it's it it is, and I mean, it's beautiful, it's aspiring, but I guess it's also it also makes you as an academic vulnerable, uh, because the, the the hardcore social psychologists will have something to complain about, and the cultural studies people will have something to complain yeah, about. They and... do. They they they've they've all complained at me all all, <laughs> all my career. Um, I, um, I find that I do thrive on a bit of complaining. Um, <laughs> and if people try to close the door, um, I find myself banging. So I'm a little bit kind of um, uh, determined in, 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 in that regard. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, um, maybe I, 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 I take seriously the idea that this effort to know and to understand is a struggle. Um, and the disciplines, perhaps because I was brought up within this discipline of psychology, which is very fond of um, policing its boundaries and um, ensuring that everyone kind of 
you know, stays in the heartland and does everything correctly according to, you know, dis it is disciplinary. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, uh, so, but psychology is also the understanding of how people think and understand and live in the world. And so I have always resisted the disciplinary nature of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and that has sought you know, that, so then I kind of looked elsewhere and, you know, I wrote that PhD in, in the 1980s when um, everything that was happening in the Birmingham Centre for Cultural Studies was just kind of defining our field uh, right. in ways that were so productive and generative and uh, opened my eyes to kind of literary analysis of media and media texts, cultural analysis, political analysis. So I kind of immediately put myself on that um, the boundary is the wrong, it's a kind of to and fro. I think I'm always doing a to and fro uh, between different disciplines and um, being both the insider and the outsider are problematic um, and always standing on the on the bridge between them is problematic, but I actually think there's no, uh, that that's also creative. So, um, okay, so you like a little bit of complaining, you like people saying, but, but wait a minute, you can't gonna, do you're that. You're gonna do it now, yes, go yeah. on then, complain. <laughs> But but um, uh, oh well I'm I'm well I'm gonna bounce that back because next to complaints about your perspective or your sort of being on the edge or in between, you've also been getting a lot of acclaim. I mean, the, the Order of the British Empire. I mean, you've received a beautiful Erasmus Medal as a recognition of your consistent quality and impact of your scholarly work. Mm. I mean, those are wonderful and and for what is worth well-deserved accolades how does that make you feel because, because i mean i'm reminded of like yeah you know, a little secret between you and me I'm, I'm a bit addicted to sort of um people giving acceptance speeches of awards on youtube i, I somehow i just get <laughs> lost in the, the genre oh and there's always this narrative of the people that are giving the award saying that i know this makes you uncomfortable but you're going to get the award anyway now, I'm kind of guessing that's a little bit of how you feel, but I, I, I mean, I don't know, but but how does it make you feel? Because you get, of course, these these wonderful uh, acknowledgements. And and then uh, what? Yes, what do you do? It, make, it makes me uncomfortable, especially the um, the E of the OBE. Um, <laughs> uh, deeply, deeply from, well, it's all deeply problematic in a way. Um, so uh, let's be honest, we, um, mm. we feel uh, awkward about and uncomfortable about being picked out from among others because, you know, work is always, I, I'm, uh, I work very collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Most of my work is co-authored. Um, I work with teams all the time. So there's something uncomfortable about being singled out. But on the other hand, um, there's something frustrating about not being heard and you know you 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 bash your brains out to write a, spend four years writing a book and then no one reads it or no one notices it. that's undermining and that's frustrating and you know I, I I do absolutely write everything I write for an audience and for and, and often for an imagined and quite specific audience that I want to uh, tell about something or convince or represent um, others too so uh, yeah, so I, I, I feel awkward being noticed, but I don't want to not be noticed either um, and not be heard. Um, and, um, you know, personally, uh, having got some of these awards means that doors are open to me that I can now kind of go and speak in um, maybe more elite or more influential forums. And then I feel I have the responsibility to do something with that opportunity. Um, so, and that's uh, actually bringing a kind of a new set of challenges and a new set of interesting uh, tasks to me, which I'm quite kind of enjoying too. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it seems very Oscar Wilde, right? The worst thing about being talked about is not being talked about. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, and I suppose I do, um, you know, so so what would I worry about? One thing I worry is um, having the door open to some significant decision making um, place and then not having something credible to contribute. Mm. And a lot of what motivates my work is making sure I have the thing to say that is going to be needed 
kind of at the time in an ongoing flow of argumentation and decision making and um, often uh, confusion and misunderstanding. Um, and so I spend a lot of time kind of honing my arguments um, and I write right. my speeches shorter and shorter. So this is, you know, it's nice to have this hour, but um, often I'm given kind of three minutes uh, mm. to, you know, say the thing that needs that I want to say and I don't want it to be a wasted three minutes. So. Mm. that's a new challenge for an academic who's used to an hour yeah yeah or 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 like 500 or, or pages five years for a book yes. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yeah i mean there is i mean you mentioned it before right that 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 we are now as academics increasingly moving into a time in a in a, in a context of higher education where for lack of a better word, impact is something that we're being evaluated on, being assessed yeah. for, um, and and that's 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 sort of a given. But then there's also, I mean, and we can complain about that or be critical or or and and like you said in the beginning of our conversation, you know, what about knowledge for knowledge's sake? Well, yeah. Um, and on the other hand. Um, it's, like you said, when you, when you work really hard on something, and you, especially if you work with a team and 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 you work with, with you know real human participants that have a story to tell that you care about in one way or another, then it's it's it would be incredibly frustrating if it doesn't have at least some kind of impact. Mm -hmm. um, maybe br briefly, like like uh, and, and you in your answers, you you talk about how this notion of impact has sort of come to grow on you uh, um, I mean I mean where did it start I mean maybe if I can be a bit more specific uh, your mentor and dear friend and our our, our 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 incredibly respected colleague Jay Bloomer passed away not so long ago and mm -hmm. and you credit him with with mm -hmm. with encouraging you to do research specifically with children and on children. Uh, I mean, is it is it sort of where that started, where you realize, well, you know, I have impact, or I, I I want more with my work than just the academic publication or whatnot. Uh, maybe, yeah. He didn't just encourage me. I mean, he gave me a load of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is encouraging. Yes, <laughs> very encouraging. And that was I kind of you know thinking which um, article to, next to write, and he said, you know. Here is a significant amount of money and it comes with a commitment to working with finding and working with colleagues in um, as many other European countries as you can to chart uh, this, you know, and he, he saw it and I didn't, but that was mid 90s and the media world, me, the media landscape was changing radically and he said mm -hmm. get in there, start studying it now and then you track the the, the transformations that people are living through and that actually became my um, that became my career and my and my life. Yeah. Um, so it was a it was a real turnaround moment. But uh, um, I guess it's very I find it very hard to uh, be writing an academic article for an academic audience at the same time as I know that um, the policy world or the world of practice um, or the public is operating with what I see as misunderstandings or misconceptions or ignorance or uh, bias. And I, I find it very hard to kind of um, not get out there and say, no, actually, research says, no, actually, you're wrong because, no, actually, you need to think about this as well. Mm. Uh, and another surprise to me uh, was I always thought, and I'm always being told that what those policymakers and practitioners want is evidence, and they do. But what I've learned is that what they really, really want and appreciate is clarity of thinking and kind of concepts they can work with, um, uh, uh, ideas or framework, conceptual frameworks that kind of cut through the confusion and the, the, the kind of um, ossified set of assumptions that they're always working with. So fresh thinking, if you like. Right. And that's very interesting because actually they, there is a kind of a... Uh, and a hunger for intellectually what the academy can offer um, in the world of policy and practice, and that was that was news to me, and so uh, and a delight to you know try to to um, contribute to. Um, but I, I do also would just add, I think you, I think when you if you spend your research time with people, with you know if I 
knock on the door of um, uh, a relatively kind of disadvantaged family, or I take up the time of fantastically busy teachers, or I ask children uh, to let me follow them around for a year. I think, you know, there is a reverse commitment. I think you can't, mm. you can't take those people's time and energy and um, goodwill and not take what they say somewhere. And so in that sense, um, I think audience research does kind of become advocacy work as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can talk forever, but I, I know you have a lot of pressure on your time. Uh, um, so I want I want to conclude perhaps our conversation um, with a bit bit more of a personal question. I mean, f from the beginning of your career. You've re regularly done research, uh, engaged in projects, and, and published. And you already referenced uh, the book could talk about television with your life partner, with, with Peter Lund. And 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 I mean, I, I found I don't know if this is a correct reference, but I found a report that both of you were involved in on 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 sort of airfield safety or something, aircraft safety, but in the mid 1980s. I mean, you've always been very active in the field together. Um, you've supported and mentored students and colleagues from all over the world, including me, which I'm really grateful for. You've engaged in policy debates, wrote books, articles, white papers. Um, I, I guess I would. I, I wanted to ask about it. How do you keep that 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 relationship slash partnership going for 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 so long? I mean, for example, how do you keep finding projects that both of you are excited about? And I'm not just asking for you, but I'm also asking about for many of our colleagues that are in some kind of academic couple kind of relationship, uh, either working together or not, of course. But but what what have you learned? Uh, <laughs> what are your tips uh, for those of us <laughs> in those situations? Um. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's funny you're taking me back to that that first that first study that we did together. We were working on such different PhDs, uh, uh, and actually it was a very upsetting project. It was um, soon after um, a major a plane crash in Manchester where everyone died, yeah. and um, the it was a it was a classic. You'll recognise my 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 life's work since. Um, the technicians had kind of worked out what happened with the crash and the um, engineers were kind of coming up with their analysis and the uh, you know air um, safety folk were trying to work out what they should have done and and the pilot training was big and um, our project was what about the people inside what did they do mm -hmm. and they took us to that um, the you know the burnt out carcass of, of that particular plane and then they had a mock-up and they said, okay, we're gonna fill this plane with people and we want you as psychologists to understand what do people do in such a dreadful situation? And it was so, I, I mean, now, now I think back to it, it was such a real, you know, that is a, that is a question for, we need to understand what do the people do in extremists? And some got out and some didn't, why? Uh, and so that's when um, Peter and I began working together and, um, then we got into um, media studies and our, our, our projects took different um, foci. But you know, we only write a book together once every 10 years. But there's oh, a, only, only. There's a lot of time in between when we don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, um, I think academic work is um, lived and talked about. So for me personally, I can't imagine not talking about what I'm doing. And I talk about it to anyone and everybody. Um, and I get something back from everyone I talk to about it. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, Peter and I bring our different perspectives together periodically. We talk about everything we're doing in between. Um, I'm afraid my children have been engaged in all of my work on children. Uh, come here and look at the screen, check this out, help me understand. Um, so I don't see academic work as something that I do nine to five and then I stop. Uh, and so for me, that's, it is, it is part of my life. As, so I, 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 yeah. Um, otherwise, I, I in answer to your other question. I think I just get up every morning thinking there are all these things to be done and understood, and that's interesting. So, it's a beautiful thought. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm optimistic, but I can always think. Of, uh, I always, I seem to have a lot of ideas about how things could be a bit different, and I'm keen to kind of um, map out the vision of how that could be and try to take it to those who have some power to make a bit of difference. 
and and bringing a lot of people along for the ride and i think that's really important to recognize here too that uh, that's definitely um, what you do yes so uh you know it really is mutual and it really is collaborative and i don't you know i don't have the power to interview fifteen thousand children around the world on all continents in different i mean they, these are you know these are um peer collaborations um in which uh, i learn and i benefit and i hope others do too absolutely um, yeah sonia i thanks so much for your time and 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 for 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 opening up and telling a bit more about everything that you do and have been doing I really enjoyed enjoyed this and uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> thank you for taking me back to well, somewhere in the 1980s and um, <laughs> seeing the consistencies actually in what I do is a bit dismaying really, because I could never <laughs> see where anything was going, but uh, it turns out that, uh, yeah. Oh my God, I've been thinking this all along. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or as my mother likes to say, what another book on that same subject? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all different. <laughs> <laughs>